about 8 billion inhabitants of planet Earth found out the same terrible news in one day. Someone saw it on TV. Others heard it on the phone while scrolling through social media or listening to music. Some witnessed this news in a dream while sleeping. Someone's voice said it in all languages to ensure everyone understood it. I have good news and bad news for you. Let's start with the bad news. You're all characters in YouTube videos in which your planet gets into a situation where the moon breaks in half. For the audience, it will be a hypothetical story, but for you, these events will become a reality. The good news is that I was joking. There is no good news. But don't worry, the apocalypse won't start on your planet. Maybe just a little bit. Have a nice day. At first, the entire population panics. Then, a few days later, everyone calms down. Maybe it was a mass hallucination, and the moon will be all right. But at this moment, scientists have discovered the danger. A colossal meteorite is flying towards us from the distant depths of space. This meteorite is super fast and pretty flat, but has sharp edges. Fortunately, it will miss the Earth by a few thousand miles, but the moon won't be that lucky. The meteorite flies through our Earth's only natural satellite directly in the middle. So it passes through the moon, sweeps past our planet, and flies away into distant space. At this moment, all people can't take their eyes off the moon. The meteorite cuts it perfectly in half, gently, clearly, painlessly. So what shall we do now? Will the Earth survive this? Our satellite breaks into two equal parts, but fortunately, they don't fly away from each other. The moon's great gravity attracts them back like a magnet. Scientists are sure that the parts will connect in a couple of billion years and the moon will become the same as it used to be. But the coolest thing is that people won't feel any changes. Everyone around the world will celebrate this good news. The voice was wrong. But then another problem appears. A massive meteorite in the form of a shoe is flying from the deepest space to us. It enters our solar system and approaches the Earth at high speed. The space boot crashes into one half of the moon and then flies away. Now, the moon is definitely breaking into two parts. The first half remains in the same place. The second one is flying towards us. A small meteor shower begins on Earth because of the falling moon fragments. But it's not so bad. Most of these rocks are burning up in the atmosphere. But almost the entire split-off half is falling apart around the orbit of our planet. It forms a stone belt. Now the Earth is like Saturn. Rotating fragments destroy part of our artificial satellites. Communication and the internet work inconsistently. It takes people a couple of years to restore a stable connection. The International Space Station no longer exists. Luckily, all the astronauts managed to return to Earth before half the moon got to them. So, moon rocks are flying around the planet, and people see half the moon in the sky. Life doesn't change much for the first few days, but those who live on the coast of the seas and oceans notice the consequences. The moon used to influence the tides. It was flying around the Earth and made oceans take an oval shape. There were tides on the side where the moon was closer. There were ebbs on the opposite side. But now, this schedule is wrong. Half of the moon attracts less water. Yes, the moon lost half its weight and began approaching the Earth. But its gravitational force has become weaker. Seabirds, many species of fish, sea turtles, and other coastal animals may not survive these changes. Their natural instincts associated with the moon help them determine the time for getting food, breeding, and flying south. For example, tiny turtles expect a strong tide in the morning. They run to the water, but the water doesn't reach them. Turtles can't hide in the ocean in time and become dinner for seagulls. Crabs can't lay eggs because the tide has started earlier than usual. Wolves go mad in the woods. They howl loudly every night and can't stop. The whole natural world can't understand what's going on. The human body is also feeling some discomfort. Many people have low and high blood pressure, and some experience severe headaches. Half of the moon changes the entire ecosystem of the planet. Adapting to new conditions will take several tens, maybe hundreds of years. A couple of weeks pass, and people notice the days are now shorter. The moon always slowed the Earth's rotation and made one day last 24 hours. The Earth is spinning faster now. The night and the morning come earlier than everyone is used to. 
Earth rotation speed has increased and reduced the number of hours per day to 15. People suffer from insomnia or oversleeping. The body needs time to get used to it. Work schedules are changing all over the world. Previously, people came to the office at 9 and left at 6. Now, they arrive at 7 and leave at 2 p.m. Sleep time got shorter, and people are really sad because of this. Progress slows down because the short working time. The technologies of the future are now 20 to 30 years late. Hourly pay remains the same, so bosses now pay less for fewer working hours. The whole moon stabilized the weather and climate on the planet. Look at Mars. It has two small moons. They quickly spin around it and rock Mars around on its axis. As a result, strong winds, sandstorms, and thunderstorms often happen on the red planet. Now the half of the moon that approached us takes the Earth out of stable rotation. This changes the seasonal temperatures in the world. It even gets hotter in hot places. And snowstorms are raging in cold regions. There are short, massive downpours instead of sunny weather. A typical breeze can grow into a hurricane and small waves into a tsunami. The seasons are changing faster now. Winters are colder and summers are hotter. Changing the rotation of the planet affects the Earth's magnetic field. Since the compass and navigation systems are unstable now, we need to recalculate where the north and south are. Birds can't fly south to wait out the winter since they don't know what direction to fly. Their inner compass is broken. Several hundred years have passed. People are entirely accustomed to the new conditions on Earth. New species of animals and fish have appeared. Birds can navigate the sky by the moon again. The planet's economy has been restored. Hourly wages have become higher. People now get enough sleep from 5 to 6 hours a day and work for 4 to 5 hours. The reduction of day and night has also affected the entertainment industry. Movies now last one hour. One episode of some TV series lasts 30 minutes. Life goes faster. An average person now lives to be 96 years old. In fact, the passage of time hasn't changed at all. Its calculus did. Several thousand years have passed. People look different now. Now they have big eyes that absorb more light. Half of the moon doesn't shine as bright as the whole thing, so the nights have become darker. It took the human eye a couple of thousand years to develop the ability to see clearly in this new dark. Animals need to navigate better in these conditions, so their eyes have become larger and more sensitive. During all this time, people have cleared the orbit of moon rocks. Several space stations fly around our planet. And again, people hear this strange voice that once told them that they were all characters in one hypothetical YouTube video. This time, the voice says, Your story ends because the video ends. I'm sorry. Good night. Back when Apollo missions were launched, astronauts returning from the moon claimed that moon dust, the gray sand-like dust covering much of the satellite surface, smelled and tasted, yes, they actually tasted it, like gunpowder. But the stuff moon dust is made of is nothing like gunpowder. About half of its composition is silicon dioxide glass from impacts with meteorites. They hit the surface of the moon at incredible speeds. Whoa! The high temperature makes the topsoil fuse into glass, and the impact shatters it right afterwards, creating the gray and clingy dust. The rest of moon dust ingredients are minerals such as iron, calcium, and magnesium, while old-fashioned gunpowder consists mainly of saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. In other words, moon dust shouldn't smell like gunpowder, but it does. Besides, when astronauts brought samples of it back to Earth, there was no smell left at all. One explanation could be that the moon is similar, in a way, to Earth's sand deserts, like the Sahara. It's extremely dry and arid. When you sniff the air in a desert, you don't smell anything. But if you get caught in the rain there, the moisture will raise all kinds of odors from the ground that were previously trapped in the dry sand. With moon dust, it might be similar. While on the surface of the moon, it doesn't smell at all. Not that the astronauts could sniff at it wearing their spacesuits, though. But when brought back inside the landing module, the dust came into contact with moisture in the air and started emitting its strange odor. Another reason for this could be a reaction of moon dust to the solar wind. Ionized particles from the sun hit the bare surface of the moon and stay there. 
there's no thick atmosphere to protect it from those ions, so they travel freely right to the ground. They're very lightweight, so they can fly off and sort of evaporate from the slightest of nudges. And when astronauts took the moon dust samples to the landing module, those particles could have started moving around and giving off the specific smell. This might also explain why the samples didn't keep their odor when brought back to Earth. Since the particles are so light, they might have flown off the samples already in the landing module. And when they were placed in airtight containers, there were little or no ions left on them. Another explanation is that those airtight containers weren't so airtight after all. Moon dust is basically very small crystals with extremely sharp edges. They unexpectedly made tiny cuts in the seals, letting in air and moisture, and so the ionized particles leaked out of the containers. Scientists believe they should study moon dust on the surface of the moon itself to find out everything about its properties. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of craters on the surface of the moon made by falling asteroids, but one of them drew a lot of attention. It turned out to not be just an impact crater, but a tube, looking most like an entrance to a cave system. Scientists found a specific echo pattern that suggested there was a hollow area beneath. They discovered more echo patterns at a couple of places near the hole, so there could be more lunar tubes there. But in this big tube, you could place an entire football field. Researchers believe there could be an entire geological wonderland under the surface. It could be a good shelter for astronauts landing on the moon or even be a harbor for a lunar colony. No one ever managed to stay on the moon for more than three days because of the conditions on the satellite. Wide range of temperatures, low atmosphere, no magnetic field would protect life on the surface from things like radiation or solar wind. Astronauts wear spacesuits. They can't protect them over long periods of time, but a lava tube could. When a lava flow cools, it gets a hard crust, which later thickens and creates a roof over that same lava. It continues to flow, but when it stops, the channel can drain, and that's how an empty tube appears. Our planet also has lava tubes, but they're not as big as the one found on the moon. Back in 1178, I wasn't around then, at least five people in England claimed they had seen the moon split into two from its upper tip. It was in the shape of a crescent at the time of the event. When the crack widened, fire started blazing from it, which the single monk who chronicled it described it as a flaming torch sprang up, spewing out fire, hot coals, and sparks. Then the moon started shifting around and pulsating, but soon stopped and turned a slightly darker shade. The event didn't receive much attention from scientists, though, until the second half of the 20th century. Researchers studied the chronicle and figured out there was a huge, 14-mile-wide crater on the surface of the moon at about the spot described in the book. Only a very large asteroid could have left such a scar on the satellite's face. And when they investigated it more closely, they found out it was pretty recent by astronomical standards. In fact, it really could have appeared about 800 years ago. But in that case, millions of fragments from the asteroid and the moon would have hit the Earth as well. And then people would have seen an incredible meteor shower. It would have been very bright, and the memories of it would have definitely been in the archives. But that didn't happen. In addition, many scientists argue that the crater isn't as young as it might seem. The most popular and justified theory is that it's about 1 to 10 million years old. If it had appeared as recently as 800 years ago, parts of the surface of the moon in and around the crater would still have been warm from the impact. The most likely explanation of what really happened back in 1178 is that observers were extremely lucky to see an asteroid falling towards the Earth and burning in our planet's atmosphere. The spectacle would have been incredible, and seen from a proper angle, the burst of the asteroid could have really looked like it was the moon exploding. That would explain why there were so few witnesses of the phenomenon. The right spot to see the show, as they did, was only a couple of miles wide. As for real events on the moon, water and oxygen were unexpectedly discovered on it not long ago. Water might have been brought to the satellite by asteroids hitting its surface, many of them carrying H2O molecules, and those that are left on the moon in tiny amounts after the impact. There's precious little water there, though. By comparison, even the Sahara Desert has more of it than the entire moon. Oxygen is also present as separate molecules floating around, so you still can't breathe on the moon. 
solar wind brought them there, waves of energy from the sun travel at extremely high speeds through space, scrape oxygen from the upper parts of our atmosphere, and carry it further. Eventually, the wind with the oxygen molecules reaches the moon. And that's where something incredible happens. The moon starts rusting. There's plenty of iron in the lunar soil, and when it's exposed to oxygen and water, it naturally rusts. Some parts of the moon have actually already turned slightly reddish. They're regions where there's the highest concentration of molecules. If this process goes on long enough, in the distant future, the moon will look like Mars. It will turn orange-red. Yes, the signature color of Mars came exactly from the corrosion that began there thousands and thousands of years ago, when there were rivers and seas with water and an atmosphere with oxygen. Another unusual phenomenon is the blue and red lights on the moon. They can be seen when it's crescent-shaped. The flashes come and go very quickly, almost like lightning. And in fact, that's what they basically are – electric bursts. Tidal forces are to blame for this they cause mechanical stress buildup in the rocks. This can produce an electric field, which creates the blue flashes that have surprised many amateur astronomers. But still, there's so far been no green cheese discovered there. Or moon pies, for that matter. Disappointing, I know. Now, what would Earth look like if it was the only planet in the solar system? Or, what would happen to our planet if the moon went missing? Or, what if dinosaurs had never gone extinct? We've all heard the story. Over 66 million years ago, a big asteroid hit Earth. Almost 75% of creatures that roamed the planet at the time were wiped out in mass extinction. Among them, dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, all gone. But because of that, we're all alive. According to science, the human race was developing more safely without these gigantic creatures hunting us. But what if that asteroid had crashed to the ground a few miles away from the place where it fell? What would the world be like today? Imagine walking down the street to your local supermarket and coming across a truck-sized T-Rex. Could that ever happen in this alternate universe we're talking about? Well, dinosaurs would have had to survive a lot more than an asteroid to be living nowadays. About 55 million years ago, the temperatures on the planet rose. The climate became 14 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. Rainforests flourished, and vegetation was abundant. In this scenario, herbivore dinosaurs would have likely thrived. But they would have started to look a bit different. Plants started growing during that time period were not very rich in nutrients. This means that dinosaurs would have probably shrunk in size, not having the necessary energy to grow all the way to their full size. Then, about 34 million years ago, South America and Antarctica split, which resulted in a cooler and drier climate. During this period, long-legged dinosaurs would have been the ones to survive. At that time, animals had to travel long distances to hunt since seasons started to affect the availability of food and water. Compared to the mammals of that period, dinosaurs would have had significant advantages, like having more teeth or better eyesight. And speaking of mammals, some of them probably would have never evolved. That would have become dinosaurs' breakfast first. By the way, did you know that some dinosaurs live among us today? Think pigeons or birds in general. They've all evolved from dinosaurs. Now I bet you've heard once or twice that we use 10% of our brains. If this was true, what would happen if you used 100% of our brain? Would you be able to compose a symphony? Would you become a tech genius and create a multi-million dollar company overnight? Let's start with the facts. We don't only use 10% of our brain. This notion became highly popularized by movies, but it's not very accurate. The truth is, the largest portion of your brain is active at all times. But not all parts are working simultaneously. The exact percentage varies from person to person. Now, neurologists say you wouldn't be using 100% of your brain's capacity at once. Your body simply wouldn't have enough energy for that, which means you'd be hungry all the time. Imagine the number of calories you'd need to consume for that to work. You would also be limited by your body's basic needs – breathing, digesting food, and circulating blood. So if you did use all of the capacity of your brain, you'd be tired all the time, 
It'd be worse than running a marathon without any preparation. The brain would need all the blood you'd have, which would mean less oxygen for your lungs. Different organs would begin to shut down one by one. In a nutshell, it'd be terrible for your health. By the way, some researchers have estimated that more than 60% of the brain is composed of something that is called neural dark matter. In other words, this dark matter consists of neurons that have no apparent purpose or simply don't respond to common stimuli. Marathons are some of the greatest feats of strength and endurance in the world, but what would happen to your body if you decided to run a marathon without any training? The statistics are overwhelming. Nearly 50% of participants drop out of the race before crossing the finish line. A regular marathon is 26 miles long, and if you're not used to physical activity, it's a great challenge. You'd probably be able to run the first mile without any serious problems, but breathing loudly and heavily through your mouth. By the third mile, your body temperature would skyrocket, and you'd feel as if you have a mild fever. You'd most likely give up here. But if you decided to keep going, you'd have to trick your mind and body into running another 23 miles. By the 20th mile, you'd hit what is known as the wall. Your body would have burned all your reserves of glucose, and you'd get extremely tired. Even experienced runners often go through this stage. By the end of the marathon, you'd be promising yourself to never do this again. You'd leave the race with at least a few cramps and many food cravings. Now picture this, it's a clear, beautiful night. There are no clouds and you can see two of the brightest planets in Earth's sky blinking up there. Those are Mars and Venus. Now have you ever imagined what would happen if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? If the other planets never existed, things would be really different for our Earth. The planets in the solar system work together, keeping one another in certain place with their gravitational pull. Now, if Mercury or Venus ceased to exist, Earth would drift closer to the Sun. Our atmospheric temperature would become similar to that on the surface of Mercury, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. This would make life on Earth impossible, but if Jupiter or Saturn disappeared, Earth would most likely drift further away from the Sun, and its temperature would drop to below negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If life managed to survive in such circumstances, it would probably be aquatic. The position of Earth in the solar system not only affects all kinds of life forms, but it also dictates seasons, the length of days, and how long one year lasts. Now when we say no other planets, we mean no moons either. So what would happen if one fine day the moon just disappeared? That would have catastrophic consequences. The moon has the largest influence on Earth's tides. In a moonless universe, Tides would shrink by about 75%. This would greatly affect crabs, mussels, and sea snails that live in tidal zones. This would consequently disrupt the diet of larger animals. Eventually, it would affect entire coastal ecosystems. Earth's weather would change. Tides and tidal currents help mix cold Arctic water with warmer water from the tropics, stabilizing the climate worldwide. Weather forecasting would become almost impossible, and the average difference between the hottest and coldest places on Earth would become extreme. The absence of the moon would also influence Earth's tilt. Right now, Earth tilts on its axis at 23.5 degrees, mostly due to the moon's gravity. With no moon around, Earth's axis would wobble between 10 to 45 degrees. Scientists believe that even a slight difference in Earth tilt can cause huge changes, such as an ice age. Other than this, a moonless sky would upend the lives of many nocturnal animals. Moths have evolved to navigate using the light of the moon and stars. Newborn baby turtles use the moon's light to find their way to the ocean. Different animals rely on both darkness and a small amount of moonlight to hunt effectively. Now how about we travel far back in time and imagine what would happen if you lived in ancient Egypt. This civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. Ancient Egyptians were responsible for building some of the world's most recognizable symbols, the Great Pyramids at Giza. If you'd lived in ancient Egypt, you'd have witnessed a time of enormous scientific and mathematical breakthroughs. Ancient Egyptians organized themselves in strict social structures. 
so you'd probably have to fit into one of them. You'd have either been born a laborer, a farmer, or a specialist, which was either a soldier, a sailor, or a teacher, or you'd have been part of the Egyptian elite. If you had been a farmer, you'd probably live in a house made of mud bricks. You'd have had a stone oven and kept your food stored in a pit in the ground. You'd have spent your days tending to crop fields by the Nile River or taking care of cattle and ducks. On tax days, you'd have packed up some of your harvest and brought it to the temple as payment for the usage of land. If you'd been a member of the elite, you'd have spent most of your days in banquets. You would have adorned yourself in gold and semi-precious stones, displaying all your wealth. If you had lived in ancient Egypt, maybe you would have been one of those who invented tables. Yep, before the Egyptians, there was no such thing as a table. This invention appeared as a way to keep food off the ground.